let's just watch the regular video then. I'm Brad Palumbo, and you're watching Brad Reacts on Right Now. Every week on Brad Reacts, we break down the craziest and cringiest political stuff that's going around on social media. If you're new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button below, because today we're reacting to Marxist Not and gonna be happening, communist Brad. TikToks. Now let's get oh, into wait, it. Oh, wait, we missed, we missed the, the first, first funny thing he said. Because today we're reacting to Marxist and straight up communist TikToks. Marxist and straight up communist. All right, these TikToks aren't just Marxist. They're also communist. So uh, nobody tell Marco Rubio. Nobody tell Marco Rubio that these TikToks are not just Marxist, but even communist. You know, because Marco was really worried that worried that Joe Biden's most recent spending bill isn't socialism, it's Marxism. So conservatives are very smart. Now let's get into it. Zeke, roll the first one. Zeke? If you can't live without something. So this is kosher. So he he made this video, right? And I immediately knew what kind of arguments people were gonna make in response. So I made a TikTok saying, I know what arguments people are going to make. Um, and the arguments that I predicted people would make are exactly what Brad is going to say. <laughs> it should be free. Simple as that. Stupid liberals. Let me explain economics to you. See this graph? See how those two lines intersect? That's why people have to starve. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Well, that one, I want to roll my eyes so hard, I, I don't even know how to respond because, for one, let's just delete the word free from your vocabulary. Free doesn't exist. Free is a myth. Somebody has to pay for everything. And when they say free this, free that, what they mean is taxpayers pay for it. What they mean is you and me pay for it every time we get a paycheck and taxes. That's not what they're talking about. Kosher is a communist. He doesn't support taxation. He supports the nationalization of major industry, which is exactly what I said in my response to this video, which I think actually got even more uh, interaction than Kosher's video. Um, but apparently Brad didn't want to react to the one where I explained why his argument is wrong. Um, but socialism does not mean taxation. You are talking about social democracy or even liberalism. Yeah, it's so hard. I, I don't even know how to respond because for one, let's just somebody has to pay. For and also, it's not that they would be free, right? We're saying um, the essentials can be provided free of charge, but those essentials are already created by labor. They're already created by human labor. Humans are uh, sanitizing the water that we need um, uh, to survive, you know, and there's infrastructure that has to be built in order to set up those sanitation facilities so that people can get plumbing. The plumbing needs to be built. All of this is done by workers, right? Same with, with food production and housing production. All of this is created by workers. Only the vast majority of the, the market value of these things that are created by workers are going to non-workers, are going to a handful of people who own the means of production. So it's not that the things should be free, right? It's that the cost of things are astronomically high right now uh, because the majority of your money uh, goes to profits of a handful of people who don't even do the necessary work to provide humans with the things that we need to live and, you know, the things we expect or accept in, in modern civilization. For everything. And when they say free this, free that, what they mean is taxpayers pay for it. What they mean is you and me pay for it every time we get a paycheck and taxes come out of it. So free, no, there's no such thing as free. Now we're talking about essentials, the things that people need to survive. Shouldn't those all just be free and provided by taxpayers? Well, that's nice, but the real- No, Brad, you don't know what socialism is. Nobody's saying that they should be free and provided by taxpayers. We're saying that people shouldn't be making massive profits off housing and we shouldn't have people living on the streets when there are more empty houses than there are homeless people, right? We should have housing as a nationally provided thing. Right now, the only reason people are living on the streets isn't because there's a lack of houses. We have enough houses. It's just that, just that the system is set up so capitalists and landlords are allowed to make huge profits off of housing. So if you can't pay enough for the house and for the profits of some capitalist or some landlord who doesn't do anything, then you have to live on the streets. And guess what, Brad? That doesn't make any sense. That's the most irrational, contradictory system I've ever heard of in my life.
The question is whether we want those things provided by incompetent government bureaucrats or by free markets. And I, for one... The free market? You know, you know who wanted housing provided by uh, the government bureaucrats or who, who wanted nationalized housing instead of landlords? Adam Smith, the free market libertarian hero who invented the invisible hand. Um, let's, let's see what Adam Smith had to say about landlords. Landlord's right has its origin in robbery. The landlords, like all other men, love to reap where they never sowed and demand a rent for even the natural produce of the earth. This is the dude who invented, the, or I don't know if he invented it, but the dude who came up with the concept of the invisible hand, right, and told people that if you trust the free market, standard of living will increase as long as you do certain things like provide, you know, uh, education for the entire proletariat was something Adam Smith advocated for, or also got rid of landlords was something he also advocated for. So this guy's talking about how he supports free markets, and then he's defending landlords. <laughs> and much more likely to trust Jeff Bezos to get me the things that I need to survive on time than I am to get to the same people that brought you the DM. Jeff Bezos has never made anything and he's never brought anything, any goods or services necessary or unnecessary to anyone's house. Right. Jeff Bezos spends all day golfing or sitting on his two billion dollar yacht while warehouse warehouses full of workers bring you the things that you need. Jeff Bezos is not the, the most essential part of that process. If all the workers went away and there was just Jeff, Amazon would crumble. It would cease to exist, uh, uh, and, and as would all of the companies that Jeff Bezos owns. If Jeff Bezos went away and all the workers stayed there, if Jeff Bezos took 10 days off, a month off, nothing would happen. Nothing would happen. He's useless. More importantly, why is denigrating economics cool? Like, you know... That's not much of an argument when you're just disdaining. You're the one who didn't read Adam Smith talking about denigrating economics. You don't know what you're talking about. Later on, he's going to say labor theory of value came from socialists. It also came from Adam Smith. Denigrating economics. You're the vulgar economist. You've never picked up an economics book in your life, Brad. Things like graphs and statistics and facts and logic. Facts and logic. But I guess facts, uh, if you, you know, you don't actually have to have facts and logic anymore. You just have to say it right. Uh, that's the new uh, conservative or, or right wing strategy, right? We don't actually have to s understand economics. We don't actually have to have facts and logic. We'll just say economics, facts and logic over and over again and pretend like we're really smart. I guess that's what passes for an argument on socialist TikTok. I guess that's days. what passes See, for an argument. I guess saying economics uh, and facts and logic is what passes for an argument on right-wing corporate-funded YouTube. For me next. So I have this piece of paper that cost me one penny. Mm-hmm. If you wanted to... Another one of my friends, by the way. Very cool person. Buy it, I would sell it to you for one penny because that is its market value. Okay. I labored to turn that piece of paper into this crane. Okay. If the market value of this crane is $1, that means my labor created 99 cents of value. My labor is therefore worth 99 cents. Yeah, that makes sense. Would it be fair for someone else who didn't do any work to take 90 cents from me just because I happened to make this crane in their house? <laughs> no, of course not. That would basically be stealing. <laughs> So you agree that wage labor is theft? Well, no, because when you're a wage worker, you're working for someone. Else. They made an investment and took on all the risk. Like, it's fair for them to take some. F so this one cracks me up because this is straight up out of the communist manifesto, guys. And no way, Brad. Is it, bro? Is it straight up out of the communist manifesto? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> He, the labor theory of value isn't from the Communist Manifesto. It came from David Ricardo Adam Smith and the classical economist before Marx. <laughs> and Marx doesn't even talk about it in the Communist Manifesto. The Communist Manifesto was a party program. He talks about it in depth in Capital Volumes 1, 2, and 3, which I'm sure Brad has read. And it's just circulating around on TikTok. But this is what socialists would call the labor theory of value. The idea that a good or product, well, what it's really worth is how much labor went into it. But Marx was actually also the first critic of the labor theory of value, right? So what these guys did was they said, you know, a capitalist pays his wage and that money 
is transformed into a worker's labor, right? And then a worker's labor creates a product which is brought to market and you can predict the product's value, including its price based on the amount of labor content within it. Now you can still trace this very closely. It's something like price will track like 94%, you know, to labor time. Uh, but Marx was the first crit critic of this, right? He said that uh, uh, commodities don't stay at equilibrium, that they're constantly at disequilibrium. And also, market prices aren't necessarily going to match the amount of value in a commodity, right? Uh, spikes in supply and demand, as well as other factors, can cause price to differ from value. But what he did look at, and what he, in, you know, Marx was, uh, uh, he studied all sorts of fields, including science, um, anthropology, uh, even engineering, you could say, um, even though I don't know if that was considered a field back then. Um, uh, but what he did was he took Newton's uh, principles of conservation that were, you know, and I'm not going to go in depth on them because I'm, I'm not a scientist. But, you know, and he looked at the economy and he said, labor is what creates value, right? You cannot get around that. Raw materials and labor. You need living human action in order to create value, right? Capitalists love to say they create value. They love to come up with all these different ways that they create value through banking and financing and, and commercial or whatever. That can, that can increase the price, right? Marketing can increase the amount of commodities that are sold or you can jack up the price by, uh, in, in various ways. Uh, using different marketing techniques and whatnot, but to actually make those products and to actually deliver those products and to actually sell those products, labor is what is needed. So Marx traces labor throughout the entire, um, throughout the entire system, and he realizes that uh, a capitalist in the, in the process of production takes something that's created by the value of workers or created by the labor of workers, they sell it, and then take the vast majority of the value. Right, so even if labor doesn't translate directly to price, which Marx was one of the very first people to point this out, that doesn't mean labor isn't what creates all value. It still is. You know, tell me how much money the capitalists would have if their entire workforces went away, or if even half their workforces went away. But that just doesn't make any sense from the get-go. That would mean that two shoes that are the exact same shoe, left foot and right foot, well, one would be worth more if it was made in a way that took more time from a labor. It's so crazy watching these people explain this, right? And say, this is what Marx thought. When you know that this is the kind of idea that Marx was one of the very first people to debunk, right? He was one of the very first people to say that in a commodity's market price won't always match up with the amount of labor that's in that commodity. And then he's, you know, <laughs> saying that, no, the labor theory of value that came from Adam Smith and David Ricardo years before Marx, which Marx uh, critiqued thoroughly, came from Marx. You're a liar, Brad. You're a liar. You're ignorant. It's probably just ignorance, right? I'm sure Brad thinks he's correct here. Labor, or made by a laborer that worked more slowly. It doesn't make any sense. It's also just hilarious because they're pretending as if all that's involved in production is labor. Nobody has to hmm, take out mortgages, make investments, uh, pay taxes, manage an operation. It's just the worker shows up as if all production is, is as simple as paper origami. Well, that's why capitalism creates the potential for communism. It creates the potential for socialism, right? Because at first, yeah, you need the means of production to be organized and to expand, right? But... Once you've done that, eventually capitalism and the capitalist relations of production become a fetter on production. So what he's saying right here is, you know, capitalists organize the means of production and they make sure commodities get where they got to go. No, they don't. They just tell workers what to do, right? But in a way that only benefits the capitalist class whose interests are diametrically opposed to the working class, right? So, yeah, it would be difficult to make systems of planning uh, uh, that, that handle the logistical things. Um, and this is what, you know, socialist experiments have been working on for the last hundred years um, with varied success. Uh, but it's absolutely possible to manage all these, all these logistical things. And I recommend everyone read uh, Paul Cockshot's Towards a New Socialism, where he goes in depth on this problem. Um, and that's exactly it, that, that as technology advances, right, and as our ability to plan um, uh, plan production advances, 
uh, capitalism creates the possibility for socialism, right? Within capitalism as a totality, the potential for socialism is building and building and building until the proletariat can break through and it's actually created. I don't know, maybe that was a bit of a ramble there. Um, but this idea that capitalists are the only ones who can organize the means of production is ridiculous, right? Before capitalism, uh, it was a much different system of production, but, you know, feudal lords organized the production. And more importantly, they think that it's apparently theft to work for somebody voluntarily at a wage you guys agree to, yet these same people talk about raising taxes and they don't see that as theft. Voluntarily. Voluntarily. Why don't you just die? Why does everyone have to keep working for a capitalist? If you don't like wages, why don't you just die? It's because capitalists own everything we need to survive because they've taken them through plunder and war and genocide and now they're hoarding them for the past 200 years and allowing millions of people to starve to death and millions of people to live on the streets even though we have enough food and housing to give them. So no, that's not a choice, Brad. You know, all of us who weren't born into money like you uh, have to work. We have to sell our labor or we'll die. How does that make any sense? Zeke, roll the next one. I don't care what you say. Michelle. Michelle. Oh, okay. Uh, I have so many questions there. I don't really know where to start. But one, why are you wearing a mask to a hookup, though? It's like, oh, I can't get COVID in my, in my hookup. I think the mask isn't going to save you there. And I also think that if you're... I mean, that's a good point. If you're worried about getting COVID, you probably shouldn't be hooking up with random people. A good one there, Brad. You got one. Quizzing your Tinder hookups on their economic beliefs right before you hop into bed, you might be doing dating the wrong way. What? You think I'm going to date a libertarian? Imagine, like, meeting someone like you. The first thing I would want to know is your economic beliefs so I don't have to talk to you anymore. Not that I wouldn't talk to you like uh, in uh, just in, in regular conversation, but if somebody has the same beliefs as you, I do not want to date them. So I think it's actually a good idea to ask people their economic beliefs first and foremost. Actually, Tinder should have that as a category um, for people to put in their bio. But even more importantly, the idea that capitalism is the root of all problems it just doesn't make any sense. There was a time before capitalism existed. It was invented in the mid-17th century. There was a time capitalism existed. There were previous means of production. And there were various class struggles um, and various battles that were fought, which moved the mode of production forward, changed the relations of production, created new contradictions that didn't exist in the feudal or slave modes of production previous and brought about a new mode of production with new problems and new contradictions at its core. You're getting it, Brad. You're almost there. Were there no problems before then? Nope, there were. If anything, there were a lot more. They were different. And now the countries today That's that Marxism. don't have capitalism, do they just have no problems? If that was really the root of all our problems. And, you know, another good point, socialist, the construction of socialism is overcoming these uh, contradictions, right? Is overcoming these uh, various contradictions that pop up in attempting to build communism. So the next system is going to have uh, contradictions within it as well. There would be a lot more going on uh, than this TikTok manages to argue. Zeke, what do we got next? I know this person as well. They post hilarious socialist videos with their dogs, and we've talked in the DMs a little bit. Okay, nope. That's not going to work for me, folks. Don't use cute dogs to push terrible ideas. Don't do it. I love dogs, and dogs do not belong in your socialist propaganda. I mean, you can't blame capitalism for the fact that homelessness exists and food is thrown away. I mean, how much of that comes back to actually government regulations that in many places make it illegal? Who owns the government, Brad? Who controls the government? Did you know that 93% of elections are decided by the person who raises the most money? Capitalists control the government. And they lobby it to make laws that protect them. Yes, preventing people from growing food. Uh, yes, preventing people from giving food away and forcing them to throw it out. But 
as I explained earlier with the homelessness problem, the main issue and the, and the issue at the core of the capitalist system is the fact that these essential goods are owned by capitalists who are withholding them from the workers, which one, forces the workers to sell their labor power to the capitalists then in order to survive, but then two, are constantly increasing the cost, constantly increasing the cost of living and making people pay not only for the value of the house that they live in, but also for the massive profits of a landlord. So if you can't afford to pay some lazy landlord's profits, you live on the streets. Or, you know, uh, people who work at grocery stores, um, they don't take that food and give it away because that would uh, uh, lower the value of the food. You know, they want to sell that food. They need to sell it on a market in order for the capitalists to make money. If they don't sell it on a market, it has no value to them. Even though, of course, that food is valuable to the millions of people who starve every year in terms of its actual use value, right? It just doesn't have exchange value on the market, so capitalists don't view it as useful. And because capitalists are the ones who organize production, which you were saying they do so well earlier, they don't allow um, everybody to have access to these, to these essential resources. And people starve to death and live on the streets when we have more empty homes and, and throw more than enough food away to feed these people. And you don't care. You just ignore these statistics because you're callous and you're probably getting paid um, by whoever whoever funds rightly to make these goofy videos to hand out food or expose you to legal liabilities if you give away leftovers more importantly i mean when i think of the most socialist places in america i think of and this is why mutual aid will work right and this is why the number one, one of the main goals of the communist party like, the main goal should be to organize workplaces but also to do mutual aid in the communities right to meet the needs of the people because if you have a strong, powerful communist party that's building a community um, and it, it is meeting the needs of people in the community, right? When the capitalists don't meet your needs and when the government doesn't meet your needs, people know they can turn to the communist party. I know this seems far-fetched in the U.S. because our party is so small. Um, but this is how it works other places like China, right? This is why it'll work. Because you have people like Brad supporting capitalism being like, I don't care that there's more homeless people than there are empty houses. You know, I don't care that there's all this food thrown away even though millions of people starve. And if you have a party that's feeding people, that's meeting people's needs and explaining why, um, why these horrible things like starvation and homelessness are products of capitalism, and then they see the capitalists acting callously like this and saying, oh, no, you just don't work hard enough or whatever, they're going to want to side with us, right? No regular people is gonna, are going to side with an arrogant douche like this. California, I think of New York City. Hmm. Those are also the places that seem to have a lot of homeless people. Oh, well, I didn't think of that. <laughs> Did everyone hear that argument? City. Hmm. Those are also the places. America. I think of California without food or expose you to legal liabilities if you give away leftovers. More importantly, I mean, when I think of the most socialist places in America, I think of California. I think of New York City. Oh, I had never considered the secret socialist American states. I had always thought that America was one of the most capitalist nations on the planet. I thought Governor of New York Andrew Cuomo um, and Governor of California Gavin Newsom were pro-capitalist liberals. But Brad Reacts is telling me that they might be socialist because they have high taxes. So I don't know. My, my brain's kind of melting here. I don't even know how to respond to an argument so good. Hmm. Those are also the places that seem to have a lot of homeless people and, and a lot of hunger hmm. and problems. So. Oh, a lot of homeless people in uh, socialist California and socialist New York. Right. Uh, too bad that after Cuomo and Gavin Newsom rounded up all the landlords Mao style and threw them in jail or had the had the people of New York and California kill all the landlords, that there still isn't housing. Right. Despite the, uh, the great efforts of uh, our socialist leaders, Gavin Newsom and Andrew Cuomo. <laughs> Where do they find these people, man? Where do they find people to say with a straight face and just all this confidence on YouTube in public to all these people? You know, California and New York are socialist. <sighs> Who are you, Brad? So, I mean, it's bad enough to be pushing terrible ideas, but do not, do not use cute dogs to do it. Let's roll the next one, Zeke. So one of my favorite other critiques, it's commonly said that socialism and communism has failed every time it's been tried. To this, you just say, by what metric? Because the concept of failure is subjective. 
is it? Be- I love Adrian. Everyone, go follow Adrian Antianoli. Great person. Because it doesn't exist anymore. Then, in that case, do you consider every single civilization up until the ones that currently exist to be failures? And do you consider every country that currently exists to be successful? Because that's dumb. I wouldn't consider giving everyone a house, education, free healthcare, and a job, and food a failure. That's a lot better than we do here. I would consider someone dying once every 12 minutes because they don't have health insurance a failure. I consider the fact that people in Flint, Michigan still don't have drinkable water a failure. I consider a police force that arose to catch black people, runaway slaves, and continues to murder them a failure. 12 plus hour voting lines a failure. The least educated voting against their class interest a failure. Wow. Spitting. Wow. Wow, he just listed all these things wrong with capitalism. Time for me to ignore them. Adrian was spitting there. All those things are true. And all those things are products of the contradiction of capital. So, failure may be subjective, but guess what? Gulags, lines for food. Gulags! Guess what, buddy? Guess what, Brad? I'm going to let you in on a little secret. One, the U.S. prison system is incredibly profitable... Um, for companies who are part of the prison industrial complex, like the telecommunications companies who Republicans claim to hate, um, and companies like Aramark who serve food, and the Second Amendment, um, which, uh, it, no, sorry, the, thir- the Second Amendment, the Thirteenth Amendment, which abolished slavery, has a little condition in it that says slavery is abolished except in cases of uh, uh, where someone has been charged of a crime. So, you have uh, prison workers being paid less than $1 an hour. And you have an economic profit incentive to keep the prisons filled with bodies. And the corporations profiting off that prison industrial complex heavily lobby the government to militarize the police. You know, and put the police um, in in, uh, in, uh, impoverished neighborhoods so they can constantly throw people in jail and keep these prisons full. Also, you brought up the gulags. There are far more people in the U.S. prison system today, today, than there ever were in the Soviet gulags. Ever. 23% plus of the entire world's prison population is in the U.S. right now. Land of the free. But please, please tell me more about why socialism wouldn't work because of gulags. Mass starvation and war crimes that we've seen in... Mass starvation? Like... Every single day under capitalism in the global south, in the countries where the U.S. is bombing, the starvation that happens every single day, or are you talking about like in China, or like in Cuba, or like in the Soviet Union, where there were famines for hundreds of years as these countries lived under semi-feudal despotic monarchies, oftentimes backed by the Western countries, and then they massively increased standard of living uh, to the point where famines didn't happen anymore by industrializing their agriculture. Is that what you mean by mass starvation? Basically every communist country throughout history, I think that's about as objective a failure as... How's this for about as objective as a failure? How many people starve every day? Here's your capitalist success story, Brad. So, So your argument is that socialism won't work because people starve. Okay, well then capitalism doesn't work either. You're literally proving the point that Adrian was making in his original video. How did you say this out loud and edit it and post it? As you can get. And it's just nuts to me because think of the world today. Is it just nuts to you? Because your whole existence here on this platform is kind of nuts to me. Think of what societies and what countries come closest to being socialist or communist. It's not a pretty list, guys. North Korea, we've got Cuba, Venezuela. North Korea, the United States, divided Korea in half, put in a far-right dictator in the South, and then when nobody wanted to fight for the far-right dictator because they knew he was propped up by the U.S. and he had graduated from U.S. universities, Singham Rhee was his name, the U.S. decided to intervene themselves. They had two uh, people from the U.S. State Department take a National Geographic map and draw the 38th parallel across Korea. And then they bombed Korea 
to the point where U.S. pilots were complaining that there was nothing left to bomb and approximately 20% of Korea's population had died. So, so that's the violent, evil failure, that country, but, but our country's cool. You know, our capitalist country's awesome. What was the other one? Cuba? Cuba was run by a, a despotic uh, U.S.-backed gangster, the Batista dictatorship, and their country was basically slave plantations before the revolution. Now Cuba has more doctors than anywhere else in the world, and they've massively increased standard of living, despite the U.S. embargo, which is the most stringent embargo anywhere on the world, except for North Korea, which you also mentioned, where the U.S. surrounds Cuba with troops and prevents them from trading with anywhere else. And because uh, under uh, the Batista regime, the U.S.-backed dictator, uh, where Cuba's economy was mostly based on sugar and tobacco plantations, their soil became adjusted to only growing sugar and tobacco, so it, it has a hard time growing other crops that they need to survive. So, you know, they've had to come up with all these innovative agricultural techniques to feed their people, even though, or while the U.S. is holding them under an embargo, right? Because their, their soil can't necessarily grow the same food as us. And this is the kind of thing that, uh, the thing that arrogant Americans don't understand, right? Because they live on the other side of imperialism, right? They've never faced the brunt of U.S. imperialism. They've never known what it's like to live under an embargo in a country where your soil is, uh, can only grow a couple prop crops because of 200 years of slavery and imperialism from the West. I mean, these are places that people are desperate to leave. Whereas the places they want to come to are market-based societies like you have in most parts of Europe and in the U.S. Let's check where people are desperate to leave, Brad. Top places where refugees are fleeing. You say everybody wants to flee socialist countries and, and go to capitalist countries. Let's check it out. Syria, where the U.S. is doing a war where they launched a NATO intervention and have uh, repeatedly launched missile strikes into Syria and backed far-right extremist groups like Jaysh al-Islam to try and take out their, their economic and political enemy in Assad. Two, Venezuela. The U.S. currently has 166 economic sanctions on Venezuela. Venezuela's economy is dependent on oil because British Dutch Shell and Rockefeller Standard Oil extracted Venezuela's oil wealth for years at the expense of the development of Venezuela and for the enrichment of Western capitalists. Now the U.S. is holding them under 166 economic sanctions um, and their government revenue, according to the U.N., the United Nations, is decreased 99%. That's where people are fleeing. Oh, what do we have here? Number three, Afghanistan. You know who's been in Afghanistan occupying them for the last 20 years? You know who in the 1980s when Afghanistan had a, um, a, a more left-wing government coming to power? You know who funneled money and weapons into Osama bin Laden's Mujahideen? It was the capitalist United States. These are the places people are fleeing, dummy. The places where the U.S. is bombing. At the end of the day, Nobody ever fled capitalism in a raft. Yeah, they have. They have fled the missiles and the, the napalm and the Agent Orange that your and my country have dropped on them. There have been a whole lot of people who fleed. You're a liar. Zeke, let's roll the next one. Zeke. Tori. 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 I told y'all I know, like, everyone in this video. <laughs> Nicole communist boyfriend, okay? But chasing after Mr. Mustache Nicotine Addiction is counter-revolutionary when you are young and beautiful and can rob a member of the bourgeoisie with your looks alone. Find a sugar daddy. Redistribute the wealth. That's praxis. That's harm reduction. <laughs> It's pretty funny. I'm okay, laughing with that Brad. That one cracks me up. Like I said, all this content, it's not all bad. Some of it is genuinely hilarious. Even I wonder why he didn't react to any of mine. Why not, Brad? You scared, bruh? You scared? If the people pushing it are socialists. And in this case, I respect the hustle. You know, taking, redistributing the wealth to a new extreme. I See, Brad couldn't get behind these arguments of not bombing people or feeding the hungry or housing the homeless. But selling your body so that a sugar daddy pays for everything, that's the kind of thing that Brad can get on board with. That's capitalism, baby. I respect it, but I will say this. A sugar daddy relationship where you are exchanging goods and services 
for financial compensation, that's a voluntarily free market capitalist transaction. It is. And it's actually a huge problem. I mean, I know I know he's making a joke, but, you know, there's a huge problem with people staying in, um, you know, abusive relationships or, or relationships where they're unhappy because they're financially dependent on their partner. Um, it's a major problem. And, and Kristen Godsey's book, Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism, would be a great read for Brad. Well, guys, that's about all the cringe communist content. I yeah, that's about all the cringe Brad I can take for today. Adios, bucko. What a guy. What a video. Do y'all see why I was so excited to react to that? The the arguments that he made were like, it, it was like a, um, a like a nice concise collection of all of the worst arguments that have been made against socialism for the past 200 years. Just all in one place for me. What I appreciate that. I actually commented on Brad's video and I said thank you for this.